our founding fathers could have never imagined the government that we now have today. It wasn't what they intended. The government, for the most part, are uh, worker bees. They likely don't even realize who they're serving. Whether you like it or not, you are a participant in these nine systems we're talking about today. And if you're not aware of that, then you are a match, according to the laws of karma, you are a match to being abused and controlled by that system. That is exactly what the Fed has done, essentially, with the dollar bill that says debt note on the back. It's like some business that made a money printing company and tricked you into using their monopoly money. <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> Reality is crazier than fiction, man. All right, everyone, welcome back to the channel. We're extremely excited to drop the second episode of our rabbit hole series that we hope you guys are enjoying. If you haven't caught the first one, definitely make sure to go catch that one before continuing on with this video. Today's episode is going to be all about the matrix and particularly what we're going to be diving into is how the matrix was created. How did they pull this off? as far as the 3D world is concerned. So grab some popcorn. <laughs> you might want to grab a paper and a pen. Today is going to be extremely dense with gems and knowledge that you may not have heard before. We're basically going to be outlining nine of the major systems, societal macro systems that we have identified that kind of work synergistically and are interwoven and uh, feed off of one another and all together if you zoom out far enough create what we can essentially refer to as the matrix that we know uh, at least in a more 3d sense uh, not spiritually speaking all nine of these major systems i think it's pretty safe to say have been weaponized and used against us and the way that this has come about, I think, is important to first get into. There's, there's two major factors at play here as to how this has come to be. Number one is through the centralization of power. Yeah. Back when things were decentralized a bit more, uh, the opportunity to gain control of such a vast amount of people didn't exist in the same capacity. So centralization, though it brought us such advances in innovation, convenience, affordability, etc., it also came with it the burden of liability, if you will. And we've seen some of the things that have happened as somewhat of a trade-off there. For those who aren't um, totally familiar with the word Jeremy's using here of centralization of power, a good example of this would be like Google, right? Jeremy said like in, you know, a century ago, there wasn't the same capacity for this insane centralization of power like we see today. Well, there wasn't the internet a hundred years ago. So there wasn't any ability for a company like Google to have started the first search engine ever and become the search engine that, you know, 99% of human beings are using every day. And we've learned from the whole pandemic of how, Google was able to completely filter out any search result that contradicted the mainstream narrative, the government narrative. Like you couldn't find any alternative or truthful information outside of those sources. Why? Because Google has centralized all of that power on the internet. And so really, you know, the journey back to freedom and, and unity on this planet is going to be through decentralization of power. So when we use these terms throughout this episode, you know, you can sort of use that Google analogy to understand when, when a small group of people have an enormous amount of power, that's what we call centralization. Yep. Yeah. I appreciate you filling that in. That's definitely a big piece of it here. Another big piece that I think is really important to recognize and keep, it helps keep you out of a, uh, more victim mindset, right? Where you feel like, woe is me. All of this has happened. Poor me is when you simultaneously add complexity to a system, and I don't just mean like a societal system, I mean any system in life. Whenever you add complexity to something, while at the same time 
hiding and protecting certain knowledge surrounding the rules to that system or whatever it is we're talking about. You create a perfect storm for something to become weaponized and, and controlled against you. So I want you to think about um, how this stuff has come about. And as we start to get more into it, maybe this will, will make a little bit uh, clearer sense. But these systems, uh, just think of our government, for example. It has become so much more complex, layered, and hierarchical that our founding fathers could have never imagined the government that we now have today. It wasn't what they intended. And because of how many orders of magnitude of complexity have been added on top, it also invites the opportunity for corruption. So that is kind of, and, and you could use like any example, it doesn't have to be government. Just think of how complex uh, it would be for Aaron's example of uh, a big B tech business. Let's say you work at Google. How many different hierarchical levels are there? And at every level, there's fragmentation. In other words, if you're a 25 an hour employee there, you do not have clearance to the information that 50 an hour employees have. And if you're a 50 an hour employee, you certainly don't have clearance to the information that the higher level senior managers have. And if you're a higher level senior manager, you probably think you, you know a thing or two, but you certainly know nothing compared to the CFO. And if you're the CFO, there's still certain things that you do not know that the CEO and the board of directors speak about. And if you're the CEO and the board of directors, there are still a select few things that you don't know that the founder and maybe um, sh some other shadow founders know and want uh, acted out or played out that you don't, you're not fully in the know about. So I just want to clarify that, that when we talk about both centralization and understanding complexity and the withholding of certain information, I believe that that's how this stuff is orchestrated. I don't think it needs to go down these crazy, and I hate to use the word, but I'll just say it for the, for the ease of understanding, conspiratorial rabbit holes of like how it came about. I think a lot of this is just pretty basic human nature. Yeah. Yeah. I actually worked at Google so I can attest to what oh, you're wow. saying. Okay. I was a, I was a trainer at Google for four years and, uh, it's funny. Sometimes, uh, people in the comment section of my videos will give me shit for having worked at Google being like, oh, you worked for the, uh, the Illuminati organization. <laughs> so, you're, so you're one of them. Yeah. And I'm like, you don't understand how these companies work. It's, it's all compartmentalized. Like you said, I had a badge that I would scan to get into the buildings every day and my badge did it work at like 50% of the buildings in Google that I wasn't allowed access to. Mm -hmm. And like the clients I was training who were software engineers at Google, like I'd be like, yeah, what are you working on and stuff? And a lot of the time they'd be like, I can't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so you start to feel like you're almost working for the CIA or something. Like you have yeah. all this restricted access. Everyone's like not allowed to talk about certain stuff. So this is how every negatively polarized organization on the planet works is through compartmentalization you only get to know what they want you to know to be a good pawn on their chessboard. And, you know, like the classic example of Nazi Germany, when we're interviewing these Nazis back in the, you know, 30s and 40s at, um, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the Nuremberg trials, they were just like, oh, I was just following orders. I didn't know what the greater plan was. I didn't understand we were trying to commit genocide. I was, yeah. you know, just told these people were bad people and we were supposed to put them in camps and I was just following orders. It's like, so yeah, if everyone has full disclosure of truth, Corruption doesn't work very well, right? Yeah. So you better believe that they're prioritizing secrecy of information in order to weaponize that control. Right. Yeah. And I also don't think it's too much of a stretch to understand how they might uh, justify that and why they might think that that's uh, necessary, right? And the stories that they might tell themselves to um, why that, why they're doing that. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to maybe the shadow reasons as to why they're doing that. So, um, yeah, so our, our intent, part of our intent with today's, um, uh, conversation is to give as a balanced of a perspective as possible. Um, I don't think there's much empowerment in just pointing fingers and blaming them. There's always a them for all of your life's woes, right? So me and Aaron, um, you know, you guys should be familiar with how we go about things, but it's all about empowerment and solutions. And it's always going to come back to you if it doesn't 
there's no point in conversing about it. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't need to waste any time or energy resenting or hating or judging a they deep state Illuminati, whoever it is like, that's not how it works in reality. We're going to be showing you this today that these systems of corruption, we're all starting to be aware of that. We can get very uh, upset at resentful towards like Jeremy's saying, we have to realize like there wasn't a group of Satanists who sat around a round table and schemed up this whole thing to, you know what I mean? This is yeah. a slow evolution of human corruption over hundreds yes. of years, generation upon generation of people. Like some kid just inherits his dad's company. His dad teaches him, this is how we do business son. And this is why, because we're the best and this is how we win. And so he just goes the next step after his dad and slowly but surely these businesses and corporations all become more corrupt, all more centralized and all more profit focused and profit driven. And so then you end up with a world like we have today. So there's no great evil they ultimately that can be blamed for the way things are. It's just a manifestation of the human ego over hundreds of years. And now we're waking up to this truth and, and bringing light to this darkness and we're moving back in a positive direction. So. Like Jeremy said, we want to, even though a lot of what we're going to talk about today might seem like dark or heavy or whatever, we want to keep you in the light and understand, no, we're fully empowered. We're the creators and we're, we're the ones beginning to make a positive change in the world now. Absolutely. Well said. So I just want to make one clear statement before we get into this. Our government is not the culprit whom so many of us believe is oppressing us much of our government officials are generally either asleep or yeah. well-meaning are all of them absolutely not <laughs> are there plants are there agents are there people who are craving power working their way up through any means and intending from the very get-go to use that power for the um control of certain uh types of people absolutely but generally speaking the blanket term of the government, which most people like to blame, what we're going to be showing you today is it isn't that simple. Uh, this isn't a black and white conversation, and it's easy to just blame them, whatever them is, just the group of people. And um, I'm hoping we can get outside of that and have a more educated discussion. You know, a lot of these people working in the government, they're humans, obviously. And they're subject to biases and groupthink and in their environment, just like all of us are. And how are you to know that if you were put in their shoes, you wouldn't be acting in the same exact ways? That is where I think like we overlook our own hubris, right? We're, we're quick to grab the pitchfork and uh, try to hunt down the culprit. But in reality, like if we were born in their exact circumstances and had their background experiences and were in their uh, friend circles and had access to the information they did, how can you be so sure you wouldn't be acting in the same capacity? So that's a helpful question to ask yourself. The last thing I'll say here is that in my years of research on this stuff, I have found something entirely different to be the case. When I started researching years ago, I came into my research with an existing bias. That is not how you want to come into research, but I'll be honest about it. I came in with an existing bias, expecting to, for the research to confirm my existing biases. And what my biases were is this exact viewpoint that I'm referencing. I used to just blame the government and that was what I thought was ruling the world and what I thought was a controlling and oppressing, etc. And what I found was something completely different. This has all actually been pulled off by a select few wealthy families. We're not even talking about that many uh, people here and many of which don't even reside in the United States. And then some of which we still don't even know the names of, you know, it's popular to throw around a Rothschild or a Rockefeller. Everyone knows those names, but there are names that I don't even know still, right? Because unless they want you to know it, you don't know it, <laughs> right? Unless part of their chess game is like a reverse psychology play, which sometimes it is, then you don't know it. And that's interesting. Um, so 
lastly, they reside far higher than the government. It's important to understand that the government, which is one of the systems we're going to get into the political system, but they are much above the system of government and the systems of politics. These are just one example of many systems that they've infiltrated. Government uh, is very low on the totem pole, actually. Right. In the terms of power, there's, I think it's a graph by Forrest Gamble, I want to say. Um, we'll, maybe we'll put it up on the screen, but yeah. it shows the pyramid of power. You've probably seen it, Jeremy. Government is like the second brick layer on but just above the people and then it's government and then the banks and then it just keeps going. Yep. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That's a super cool graph. We'll try to put that up. So, um, the main thing that I'm kind of wanting to get across here is the same way that Aaron uh, explained in the Google example of like hierarchical power and, um, centralization models, the government for the most part are, uh, worker bees and at their level of clearance and information, et cetera, they likely don't even realize who they're serving. I, I genuinely don't think that the majority of the government realizes who they're serving. Even like CIA, FBI, I think that most of these people, the vast majority, get into that position because they want to help. They probably think that they're making a difference. And then human nature kind of has its way a little bit with them. And also at the same time, there's also the camp of them who probably even over the long career they have still believe they're helping. I, maybe they just haven't gone deep enough into the question of who or what am I actually helping? <laughs> and that's where this genius that we're trying to start to lay out for you, this genius approach is so, I mean, you got to give it to them. Like I've said before, you got to give it to them because um, this fragmentation combined with limited knowledge allows someone to be in a completely different nation, unheard of in certain instances, and have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people acting out their desired agenda while they just sit back and no one knows that they're actually acting out their agenda. That Come is on, impressive. <laughs> Let's give it up. Yeah. So that's part of why I like to study these people because if they can pull that off, what's going on, my friend, I want to thank you for supporting our show and continuing to tune into our content. If you've been finding our show valuable, we want to invite you to Make sure you're subscribed to our email newsletter. We are super excited to be starting a bi-monthly free email newsletter in which we will be offering free education on everything from consumer law, contract law, credit repair, credit optimization, tips on funding, financial literacy, investing, all the areas that our brand puts out education around will be taught in bite-sized pieces and this will be only offered to our exclusive email list. So if this interests you, definitely check out the link in the description. You can check out our main YouTube page and it'll be linked in the description there as well. Or you can just go to www.jgriff.org. Now let's get back to the show. There's a lot to be learned there, largely so that I'm not one of the victims. <laughs> you know, it's largely a defensive play, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like the quote of you'd rather have a samurai sword in a garden then oh, yeah be a gardener in a samurai fight or whatever it is you get what i'm saying yeah better to be a warrior in a garden versus a gardener in a yes. war yes yeah. yeah so jesus said be as wise as serpents but as innocent as doves meaning we still carry our truth and our purity and our light but we have to be on the same level of intelligence as the dark side is otherwise they'll continue to manipulate us right on some star wars shit right there <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Luke. All right. Uh, nine systems. Let's break them down. Number one, we have things like food, air, water, shelter, and energy. Think of them as your basic human needs, right? Like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the, that base level of the pyramid. So survival we could, needs. Yeah. So we could somewhat kind of call these like your basic needs or survival system. Then number two, we've got media, movies, culture, and Hollywood. 
And we could think of this as our news and entertainment system. I kind of grouped those together. Um, they could be their own systems, right? News is its own system and entertainment industry is its own system. But for the sake of uh, reducing complexity a little bit, we'll make that one system. Then we've got our, you know, how our overall money supply works, our currency and banking. That can be uh, considered our monetary system. Pretty simple there. Then we've got the conversation around standardized education. So this can be thought of as kind of like workforce or job or the education system. Then we've got the healthcare system, uh, particularly institutionalized healthcare, even though you could argue that we should call it sick care. We'll just call it health. Number six is uh, churches, religious books, and this can be um, categorized as our spiritual or religious system. Then we've got two-party bipartisan politics. This notion of a two-party system, this notion of voting, that would be our political system. Um, and then the last two, we have our courts, statutes, legislation that make up our legal system, which me and Aaron talk about a lot. Um, so, but we're going to be weaving a lot of other things in today so that you can understand that law is just a piece of it. And then lastly, we live in a world where we have an epidemic of uh, private for-profit prisons that work hand in hand with the government. And we'll get into that, so I'm not going to say much about it, but that's going to be our prison system. Are there more? Definitely. This is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> These are like the nine main umbrellas we could fit Yeah, yeah, under. yeah. <laughs> the nine levels of the matrix. That's right. Let's start out with, um, and some of these are somewhat ranked, but um, don't get too caught up on the order. Um, we're not trying to insinuate that one is more important than the other because they all work synergistically. So kind of view them as um, probably the best way to view it would be um, a circle. And there's a bunch of dots or nodes around the circle. And each of these nine areas is a dot or a node. And then you could draw like lines. So the circle would end up looking like a crazy clusterfuck of a bunch of connections. Um, that's probably the accurate way to view it. There's not necessarily a hierarchy. So food, air, water, shelter, energy. There's so much we could say about it. Um, hopefully, if you're listening to our content, you're aware that we're being intentionally <laughs> uh, poisoned, for lack of a better <laughs> word, in everything from things being dropped in the sky to things being put in our water supply that we're bathing in, showering in, brushing our teeth in, and drinking. What is being fed the animals that we're eating or what is being injected into the animals that we're eating to what kind of soil, uh, fertilizer, and water is being used on the crops that we're eating or the crops that our animals are eating. I probably won't go any deeper than that, but just to give you a quick overview, hopefully you're aware of those things. If not, you know, this isn't a health page, but health is a big piece of wealth and health is a big aspect of freedom. Somebody watching this is like, wait, they poison our food? What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, there are definitely toxins in our food. Um, and then a, a big piece that I want to touch on isn't just what's happening, but how it's happening. So there is heavy propaganda used and corruption surrounding the systems. And the way that this works is the very government organizations, think of different three-letter word bureaus, the very government organizations that get to decide upon what is healthy and what is not healthy. For example, the FDA, the WHO, are the very ones who are inextricably linked into these agendas. Now, am I saying that this is one this is our first opportunity to distinguish you can't just blame the government you have to look deeper than that it probably started with pure intentions <laughs> then funding and lobbying and everything else comes in right so it's not our intent here a big recurring theme is Stop being black and white in your analysis and your beliefs. 
we have to look deeper than that. So simple example here, the promoting of diets and mass popularization of dietary narratives that promote extremely low levels of consciousness, dis-ease, confusion, and lack of clarity. That is probably the easiest way to summarize. Jeremy, Aaron, why are you guys talking about food, air, water, shelter? <laughs> why are you talking about that? I thought, you know, you guys are mainly talking about law and freedom related stuff. We have to explain to you how your intention and attention is being hijacked. If you're unable to clearly think, if your third eye is calcified to shit, if you're unable to tap into your intuition, you're useless. The more you can be pumped full of these types of toxins, neurotoxins, things that slow you down, that cloud your mind, you become docile. You become easier to control. So I don't want to go too deep into this stuff. It should be obvious, but like, for example, a quick rundown, there's everything from microplastics, things like BPA, et cetera, um, that are known to be extremely um, toxic and harmful to uh, men's and women's hormones and massively spike estrogen levels. Look at the issues we're having today with gender, for example. Um, Lower fertility. Yes, sperm count, all of that. And then we have pharmaceuticals, <laughs> constantly pharma they're doing different tests on tap water and it's coming up for pharmaceuticals, like hard drugs. And I just read a stat yesterday, Jeremy, that said one in four couples can't get pregnant right now. Yeah. And it's deep. So you have to ask yourself, is there a reason this is being allowed? Because it there is being be allowed. There. There's no and it is being, being allowed. Yes. yes yeah. There is no question. And then we have the a big one, fluoride. And fluoride is a known neurotoxin right so we're not even going to get into dentistry but it's just like if you're drinking daily small to medium level doses of fluoride over periods of time not only the spiritual consequences we're all aware of calcifies your pineal gland it, it uh, disrupts your connection to a higher power if you will fluoride um, is like the second most toxic chemical on the periodic table i think yeah. So what I was going to say is like, let's just put the woo woo shit to the side. Let's pretend yeah. you're just a practical, We're just talking no facts. bullshit guy. Like, let's just talk science. It is a yeah. strong, potent neurotoxin. Yeah. So we'll just leave it at that. And then a lot of heavy metals, lead, arsenic, cadmium, et cetera. And there are websites you can go to. Um, I want to say it's like EWG or something like that. If you do some Google searching, um, you can go to this website and you can type in your zip code and it will show you all of the heavy metals and how many times the safe limit is in your zip code's water supply. And you're going to see things like arsenic, cadmium, lead, some crazy stuff in there, mercury. Everybody so. needs to do this, in my opinion. Everybody yep. needs to go on this website and look up your water and your zip code and what's in it. In mine, there's one chemical that's um, especially toxic in high doses called, I think it's barium. Yeah. Something like that. Yep. And it's like 485 times the yeah. lethal limit in my water yeah. if I drink my tap water. So like what we're saying here is whether you like it or not, you are a participant in these nine systems we're talking about today. Survival needs being the first one we're talking about. You are participating in big the big food system, the big pharma system. And if you're not aware of that and you're not making conscious intentions to interact with it in a positive way, then you are a match, according to the laws of karma, you are a match to being abused and controlled by that system because you're not taking responsibility in your awareness for the things you're participating in, right? Mm -hmm. We've taken that for granted with all the convenience in our society and sort of our fast food society. Everything needs to be quick and easy and convenient. And that's how we have become uh, pawns on someone else's chessboard like this and why we're the ones suffering as a consequence of it, it's just a wake-up call, right? Amen to that. So that's us touching on kind of the food, the water, etc. cetera. Um, won't get too much into the air. You can look into that. <laughs> Seems to be they're uh, trying to alter the weather on our planet, and that is the justification 
um, but the ingredients being used destroy your immune system and cause a lot of disease and issues um, with your mental health and mental clarity. So I'll just leave that at that. Isn't it interesting though, how they're doing the same thing with planet earth that they do with human bodies in Western medicine of like, let's just suppress these symptoms with harsh, yeah, harsh yeah, chemicals. Yeah. They're trying to blot out the sun with harsh chemicals. Yeah. They're trying to force the weather to change based on putting tons of chemicals in the, in the sky. It's a perfect fractal to what we <laughs> yeah, do with yeah. our own bodies. Yeah. That's a good, uh, I guess they're, uh, trying out as above so below but right right <laughs> missing it and we know bit. how how well it works out below right <laughs> yeah yeah that's funny all right so then we want to get to the shelter and the energy piece as well so if you think about um you know we we throw around these terms like the one percent um, a good example of the one percent to actually give them a name would be blackrock and if you're not familiar with blackrock i want you to go look f name me any of the 500 biggest companies in the world, right? Pick a company from the S&P 500, go to Yahoo Finance, look at the top holders of that, um, look at the top institutional holders, and you're gonna find BlackRock either number one or number two <laughs> of literally any publicly traded company worth talking about. BlackRock is a top three holder. Now, I didn't even touch on real estate, but BlackRock owns more real estate then <laughs> it's hard to put a number on it. Maybe we'll put some stats. We'll put some stats on the screen right now. But um, if you haven't done your research on companies like BlackRock and Vanguard, it's definitely worth considering uh, because if you want to talk about aggregation and centralization of capital and power, look no further than BlackRock. Um, they are buying up all of the real estate available, rain or shine, recession or not. They're buying it. They have no intent to sell it. And over time, I think this will be related to the whole WEF 2030 agenda. You will own nothing, et cetera, et cetera, and be happy. Um, it's going to become, we'll just say that real estate is going to become more and more scarce uh, in terms of availability. So that's going to affect supply and demand. But anyway, the reason that I'm bringing this up is because BlackRock, for example, is buying up all the housing. This is going to slowly drive rents up over time due to slot basic supply demand economics. And that's going to, what is it going to do? It's going to create a monopoly over shelter, basic human need. We all need somewhere to live, right? We need a roof over our head. So we're not getting struck by lightning, rained on, etc. At the most basic level, if we can have our food supply, our air supply, our water supply, and our shelter supply dictated by other families that are have aggregated power and capital over dozens or hundreds of years, depending who we're talking about. That's a situation where we don't want to find ourselves in. I'll just put no, it that we way. we don't. But that is where we are in right now. Think Skynet and Terminator. <laughs> yeah. But if it's not already obvious to you, some instant very simple low hanging fruit solutions are things like shower filters are things like reverse osmosis water filters are things like eating organic only pasture raised grass fed grass finished knowing where your food came from right some of these things i consider them low hanging fruit to some of you maybe you've never heard of that but there's a reason why there's a reason why the things that they want you to eat are so cheap and the things that are actually good for you are four times the cost. There's a reason. And so you want to ask some of these deeper questions. And I would just pose to you guys, try and experiment. Eat the food you consider too expensive because, you know, that healthy food that you overlook, you're like, oh, it's not worth it. It's four times the price. Eat that, drink that, get some filters, try that for one month and tell me if you want to go back. I have a hunch you'll never go back. Um, it is such a difference in your subjective reality that you might just start talking like me, <laughs> <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning you might start talking like we're speaking on this podcast. <laughs> you might start waking up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and honestly, these are where, um, you know, me and 
we got a little bit in now we we haven't really gotten into either of our kind of backgrounds we normally just go straight for the gems but these are this is where my earlier awakenings actually started and uh, i think we probably have that in common is like the first uh positive changes i made i wasn't coming at it from like i'm trying to learn how to um, levitate or astral project i was <laughs> i was just trying to make positive changes in my life and that started with eating more spinach and tilapia until i found out that tilapia was absolute trash and it's fed like pig slop and farm raised and all of that right so you learn over time but my point is that the nutritional changes when you change the inputs that you're putting into your body your outputs shift and the most important output sure it's it's nice to not be overweight and to have a uh, reasonably uh, good looking physique that you're happy with but the the real reason that all of this is important isn't even physical health and that's such a big reason i'm just saying it's even more important especially in today's conversation spiritually there is a war on your consciousness there is a war to keep you in shame guilt fear resentment and anger and if you can't transcend those levels of consciousness you don't stand a chance in this reality in this lifetime you don't stand a chance and to me we would be doing you such a big disservice if we just started going into like law and everything else right which everyone seems to want us to talk about but as my students know i don't just give you guys what you want i give you what you need which sometimes you don't want to hear you're not interested in it you skip over it and that's fine but I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't let you know that it's going to be nearly impossible to transcend the five states that I just outlined in terms of consciousness, in terms of literal vibration that can be measured. It's going to be nearly impossible to do that if you're pumping yourself full of antibiotics, GMOs, toxins, neurotoxins, heavy metals, <laughs> plastics, artificial hormones <laughs> like the list goes on so low-hanging fruit awesome changes to start with we did also just start 2023 so <laughs> <There's that. laughs> here's resolution <laughs> yeah well i mean you know most of us would not eat 90 percent, assuming you shop non-organic like the average american you wouldn't eat 90 percent of what's in your cabinets you'd go throw it out right now if you actually knew how poisonous it was Yep. If you worked on some science in some science labs for a while and actually worked with these chemicals that you're eating every day and how how incredibly poisonous and toxic and powerful they are, and you'd be like, oh my God, there's 10 levels higher than the lethal dose from the FDA <laughs> in my Cheerios of this, yeah, yeah. this toxin. You would never eat it. You wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. So some system has tricked you into paying them to poison you. Yes. Some organization has tricked you against your will, against your knowledge, to paying them money to be poisoned by them, and you're none the wiser. Why? Because you're not aware. Yep. And so what we're saying here is your lack of awareness is your worst enemy in this life. It is the only reason you are a, enslaved to any of these nine systems we're talking about. You know, like Jeremy said a minute ago, if someone can control your basic survival needs, food, water, shelter, etc., if they can control that, then you're their slave, like it or not. So, but you're only a slave because you don't know you are. So that's the good news is we're never, we're never victims, right? We can always rise to empowerment at any moment. But like Jeremy said, it starts with awareness. Hosea 4.6, huh? Hosea 4.6, baby. <laughs> yep. And then lastly is this energy piece, right? And I'm by no means an expert on, um, alternative forms of energy but in the research that i have done i definitely wanted to add it in here because energy is definitely tied into basic human needs right so back in the day we used to have to operate based off of candlelight and then all of a sudden we have the invention or discovery of electricity right and now we're in a space where we have gas vehicles we have electricity um, we use oil for a lot of things, but we also have things like EVs. We have solar. We're in a pretty, uh, pretty cool time to be alive. 
But at the same time, depending on what rabbit holes you've gone down, you may have come across information that this, this stuff and far more advanced than this stuff was discovered hundreds of years ago. But the people that have tried to publish this information, for example, Tesla, et cetera, et cetera, things around free energy, um, repeatedly mysteriously come up missing. I don't know if you've, uh, have you ever dove into these rabbit holes, Aaron? Oh yeah. A little bit about, um, people trying to publish things around free energy or extremely affordable energy. And then all of a sudden they die. There's a number of good documentaries a number about that. Of them. Yes. So something to look into, not going to go too deep into it, but here's just something I want you guys to understand our very energy. So gas, oil, electricity, et cetera, is heavily controlled and manipulated as well. And these, once again, we have a monopolistic situation here, right? Like you, you don't have a choice. It's not like you get to go shop around, around regarding whether or not you're going to have, um, electricity where you live, right? It's like, it's kind of a non-negotiable, <laughs> you kind of need it. And then you don't get to like a uh, price shop or like, uh, have your, uh, rights heard. It's just like, uh, here's your one option, maybe two in the entire state and, uh, take it or leave it. And so these things are being controlled and manipulated. And then there's also this conversation of, there are a lot of forms of cheap, free and abundant energy that have been suppressed. And then those who've tried to publish it mysteriously end up dead every time. So it begs the question. Once again, it's easy to be like our government, the CIA is hiding it. It's like, think a lot simpler. If you were the number one oil tycoon and you have over a billion cash, that's a, with a B, a billy, you got a billion cash and you get wind from, you know, your, some of your informants, some of your connections that, um, there's some really promising research coming out around free energy around just harnessing it from the 5d grid, like shit that Tesla was into stuff you can't even see. And there's devices that can catch it and harness it. And it would be available for everyone and it would advance society, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think all of these people are megalomaniacs. I don't think it's as much of a decision as I want Africans and those in parts of Asia and South America to continue to starve and die because they don't have basic, you know, their basic needs met. I don't think it's as much about that, right? Oppress the entire globe, ha ha ha, as it is like, this is where all of my family's generational wealth has been and needs to continue to be made. And if we have this, once again, you're an oil tycoon. If we have free energy published, this is going to disrupt the very bedrock of how we, my family, my, my father, my grandfather, and my kids are go have, and are going to create their generational wealth and how our family's legacy is going to be passed on. So it's can be as simple as one selfish decision from one person with enough money and now lobbying efforts, right? You got a billion cash. You can create whatever you want on the chessboard. That's you can where make you now you want disappear. Yes. Yeah, so not only is it making the scientists disappear conveniently and it has nothing to do to you with you can't get traced back to you, but it's also now injecting, um, lobbying funding, uh, probably to both sides of the, of the aisle, which we'll get into, uh, there's not really much difference there. Um, but injecting it into, and then maybe even globally different governments, whatever you need to do, all of these systems are really pay to play systems. If you have a billion cash, you can make this world look like what you want it to look like. And that's where everything comes full circle to, can you really point a finger at they, at any one organization, at any one person and be so righteous on your own hubris that you haven't sat with, if you had a billion cash and you were in that situation, you would not be tempted with the same selfish drives. Are we not all animals with highly evolved prefrontal cortexes? We all still have lower drives and amygdalas. These are messages that I think is extremely important for the spiritual community. Cause I don't know about you, Aaron, but I spent years in this camp of thinking that how could they, 
just to realize I had more shadow work to do because <laughs> they is me and I would probably have done the same thing in a different life in those circumstances. Right. We, we can no longer afford to live and pretend we're not all one. We're not all in this together because the universe will keep punishing us if we keep separating ourselves and saying, ah, th that doesn't bother me. That doesn't affect my life. That just affects other people. And eventually it will affect you if it affects others, right? So when we say there's no use in pointing the finger at they, it's convenient. It's easy to just hate a group of people and say they're the reason everything sucks. But ultimately, like Jeremy said, unless you've transcended every aspect of your own greed, right? The greed never appears in your life and your consciousness anymore because you've healed that. Well, then why do you have any reason to point the finger at a greedy big pharma company? They're just a greater manifestation of what's in you. So it's always about taking responsibility. That's where empowerment begins. Powerfully said. <laughs> Very well said. All right. So now we're going to transition to media, movies, culture, Hollywood. This is always a fun one. Uh, I don't think too much convincing <laughs> needs to go on here. <laughs> this isn't going to be a, a conversation of getting into the ins and outs of Hollywood conspiracies. You guys can do that uh, on other channels. What I want to outline here is that number one, entertainment is as old as man. If you were to have studied history, Dating back well before the Roman times, those in power have always used entertainment and basic lower level vices to lull their citizens to sleep and keep them docile. Why do they do this? It's pretty simple. If you're in power, you're what is referred to as a extremely small minority. And those that you rule over are what is referred to as an extremely vast majority. And when you're just a few and you're ruling and supposed to be in charge of the order of the many, all your citizens have to do is some basic math, some basic statistics, and they will quickly realize, yo, if we all just band together, they don't stand a chance. Let's overthrow them. And that is the number one risk management threat that every party in power has to navigate. And the way that this has usually been done throughout history, especially before there was advanced systems and technology and all that, is really simple. Give them cheap wine, sex, and violence. <laughs> Particularly, like think of like the gladiator days, like watching violence. So what are our lower level drives? <laughs> Alcohol, Drugs, sex, violence, sound familiar? Mm -hmm. So give them those things and they won't overthrow you because they'll be too busy indulging in their own vices. And so in other words, this was Rome's way of uh, let's keep them in the lower levels of consciousness. And it's done partially different today, but uh, not really the same right. approach just applied to a 2023 world. I'll the greatest highly threat highly to any body of power, the government, whatever, a king, a ruler, an emperor, their first and greatest threat on their radar at all times is not the next biggest country. It's their population. Yep. I got to make sure my own people don't overthrow me so I can rule them. That's yep. the enemy number one is the people for a corrupt yep. ruler. And so this is how, this is one of the ways we're saying is like how much ability does that population have to rise up together against you if they're drunk and hung over all the time mm -hmm. in those ancient times in the middle ages like historians will tell us this and even archaeology shows this like drinking wine and, and liquor and alcohol was so much more prevalent than we could imagine I and people are now drinking a... wine all day long to stay drunk and buzzed because they don't really know it's bad for them they just know it makes them feel good and forget about their problems life was really hard and brutal back then so people wanted to be inebriated 24 7. they yeah. didn't want to face reality and a lot of historians say actually the reason the lifespan was so short in like the middle ages and even ancient biblical times the lifespan was way shorter probably because everyone drank so much alcohol and didn't realize that that's why their immune systems were so much weaker and they died from diseases so much younger. It could literally be because they were so inundated with alcohol in their culture that the lifespan was that short. So like that's mm. a control device, right? There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. And that, that would, that also links us into health, right? 
like why are uh, cigarettes and liquor legal, but microdosing psilocybin is still not legal federally, yeah. right? Or Case in point. Any, any number of these things. Why are psychedelics banned, but you can get over-the-counter stimulants or alcohol, et cetera. So whatever poisons you, hurts you, or lowers your consciousness is widely available and legal. Mm -hmm. Whatever expands your consciousness or empowers you is illegal and banned. Yep. And that's why it's important to become your own savior. No one is coming to save you. And I think a lot of us uh, have defaulted into like, oh, it's, it's okay. Jesus will come back and save me. That's a rabbit hole for another time. Maybe Aaron has other perspectives, but that's particularly mine. Nobody can, nobody can save you because nobody can make your daily choices for you. Yeah. That's on you. Yeah. So keeping things on, on the subject of media, movies, culture, Hollywood, I wanted to lay that foundation of understanding that entertainment has been used. It's always been used. We could also call this instead of entertainment, we could call it distraction, distractionism. Uh, we've always enjoyed distracting because I mean, in the past life was so fucking brutal. <laughs> Uh, the human existence was brutal. Um, you know, think of like pr dark ages. Like there's been so many different eras where um, you were basically this scared animal who didn't have much information. There wasn't much aggregation and passing on of data. You had no idea how life worked. And it was just like, you know, nature's constantly trying to kill you. Disease is constantly trying to kill you. Humans are trying to kill you. <laughs> like it's just like it was a brutal existence, so it makes sense you needed distraction back then. And then in today's day and age, it's it's different, right? Um, there, we don't have the same threats that we had, but we still have that part of our brain. It's the same. So it's like we were built for a world that no longer exists. And most of us, because we haven't transcended our, our lower selves, we haven't learned to harness uh, and put our higher self in the, in the driver's seat, we still struggle with these same issues. And so uh, most of us need to turn to distractionism. And um, as a lifestyle, most of us live an aggregated lifestyle of distraction. And that is where media, movies, culture, and Hollywood come in. So let's touch on the media piece. First off, and we're going to put this on the screen. We have the creation of centralized, once again, it didn't used to be like this, it is now, centralized controlling media. And this is owned by only six holding companies. You could think of them as conglomerates, kind of baskets of, of companies. Um, but at the top, right, at the top of that corporate structure, there is one holding company. And I'm gonna name them for you, you guys can see them on the screen as well. We've got News Corp and Fox, We've got, and that's one, we've got Time Warner, we've got Comcast, we've got Sony, we've got Viacom, and we've got Disney. And each of those six mega global powers have all sorts of baskets of companies and brands under them. So this poses part of the problem. Why? Well, when we only have six different families, controlling virtually all options of what you can consume in the way of media, information, entertainment, even if you're thinking you're learning sports, magazines, you think you're reading like an op-ed, like non-biased journalism. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Doesn't really exist anymore. Only um, propaganda exists at this point. Yeah. So what happens in the issue with this, I'm not against capitalism. And of course, I've studied economics enough to understand that over time, power does aggregate. Uh, money does flow to those who are best at allocating it and growing it and uh, most efficient at allocating it. Basically, that's probably the easiest way to think of it. Right. So it's like, why is Elon a billionaire? Well, he's probably pretty efficient at allocating capital. He's probably better than the next person. So more money flows to him. What's going on, YouTube family? Just wanted to remind you guys that if you're enjoying our YouTube podcast content of the Conscious Wealth Podcast, you're also going to want to make sure that you're subscribed to us on audio podcast format. And you can find us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts under the name The Conscious Wealth Podcast. 
You can also check out the link in our description and we will have all of our audio platforms linked. We only put out about two episodes of high quality YouTube podcast content per month. However, on audio format, we're able to put out two episodes a week. So if you're enjoying the style of content and you want more education to dive into, definitely check us out on our audio platforms. Now let's get back to the show. So like when you see these six mega corporations that own the entire entertainment sector, media sector, you have to ask yourself the question, okay, is there any common shared goal those six would have? If the answer is yes, you're in big trouble, right? Because it's it's at the expense of you and to the benefit of those six. Yeah. And that's all we're saying here. There's no great conspiracy. Evil just needs a common shared goal and you have yourself a conspiracy. It happens every day. Yeah. One realm of the conspiracy community that really bothers me is um, these people that think that like you can't be a successful CEO of a publicly traded company or or do anything of power or status if you weren't like literally like handpicked by like a stork when you were four <laughs> and like bred and like they call them plants right like planted in there and it's like that is so black and white like i think that just helps people sleep better at night but where's the research <laughs> like the universe is not that simple you know, it, not everyone who's powerful is necessarily evil and working for the illuminati it's life is more complex than that yeah and that's really all that we're saying and you know <laughs> probably gonna get some comments saying that me and you are <laughs> co-ops co bro. now <laughs> yeah uh once again <laughs> we're not saying that doesn't exist it definitely does it's that you do yourself and the entire community who's more conscious and awake a disservice every time you make black and white grandiose claims that you can't back that's really what it is is like a lot of this is true you mix in some shit that's not and now the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater, and no one wants to take these conversations serious so my channel is always going to be focused on research if i say something and i can't back it i'll tell you that was just my opinion but most everything i say i will show you research reports i will show you Whatever I'm referencing, I'll show you data. I'll show you how I came to that conclusion and you can make your own conclusion. So um, I'd really like this, as I said in the beginning, to be more of a balanced perspective. I don't think that these six companies, I think it's much more of what Aaron described in the beginning. It's happened slowly over time, right? Like one, one thing that's really common is during recessions, companies that don't have as much cash on hand, um, and they're not yet profitable, they get swallowed up via mergers and acquisitions via bigger companies. We're seeing it right now. Amazon, Microsoft, you're seeing them and you're gonna continue to see them. Tesla, Apple, they swallow up smaller companies. Like for example, what's popular right now is AI. So you're gonna see these tech giants that aren't as advanced in AI as they'd like to be, but they need to compete with each other and be the, the leader in that if they're gonna survive the next few decades. You're going to see them swallow up smaller companies. And before you know it, they become this behemoth monolith of an institution. And that is how it happens slowly over time. So like was Walt Disney handpicked at age six <laughs> by hooded figures, a Luciferian cult and given like a, a lightning bolt scar <laughs> <laughs> or maybe yeah maybe but, but probably not maybe and i'm not saying that's why it's a question i'm posing i'm not, i don't know but i'm just saying could it just be that he had a particular vision and i have heard some sketchy stuff about him being integrated with the nazis i'm not denying any of that i'm not saying he was a good person but could it just be that over time his vision as he aged and such and enter different seasons of his life and he eventually appoints a different ceo right because it's very rare for a founder of a company that grows to any significant size to remain the ceo elon is an anomaly in that sense steve jobs is, was an anomaly in that sense that's why we quickly saw him ousted and replaced by tim cook at apple um, elon you know they're really pressuring him to not be the ceo of twitter it's not normal for the owner the founder to also be the ceo so over time, different CEOs get appointed. And remember what we said about the sheltering of information at different levels, compartmentalization. 
Well, even the internal stuff of the business isn't fully going to be shared with the founder anymore. It's not going to work like that, especially as more and more shareholders buy out portions of your stake. It gets diluted. You're less and less important in the decision making. And over time, before you know it, your company is not even your company anymore. So like these things are more complex and our brains, our brains are meaning making machines. And there's nothing that scares humans more than having no fucking clue what's going on. So if we don't have a fucking clue what's going on, guess what we do? We fill in the blanks. We just fill shit in and it makes us feel better. Mm -hmm. It makes us feel less scared, less out of control, less alone. But there's a it's problem with that. It's a fear response. Yeah. If you think your enemy, like pe these kind of people who believe this stuff will always say like, you know, everyone with power is working for them. Everyone is a part of their group. Like if you think everyone with power must be on the dark side, how much power are you giving the dark side in your mind? You know? Yeah. They're, they're so powerful that it's not even possible for somebody with power not to be on their side. Yeah. And I get it. It's a, it's a primitive human fear response to a perceived threat. If, uh, you know, if there was 15 of us and we woke up all of a sudden in a lion's den and there's 15 of us and, and three lions, we might start fighting with each other for a few seconds in our panic until we start to calm down and be like, okay, wait a minute. Like we got to work together here or we're going to kill ourselves. We have to overcome that fear response is what I'm saying. And we're so, yes. sort of learning to do that in the truth community. It's like, okay, yes, yes. They do have lots of power. It's going to take some good teamwork on our part to yeah. correct this mistake, but we don't need to live in fear. We yep. don't need to assume that they are, they're all powerful. They own the whole universe. It's not like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, look, maybe me and Aaron are totally wrong, but what I would say is do some real research before you insist you're right. And research doesn't mean having a biased belief going into it and then seeking out information to confirm that bias on YouTube Great point. <laughs> from your favorite conspiracy accounts. That's not research. And look, I used to do this too. <laughs> I thought research was synonymous with being able to sound smart about my existing biases. That's not research. Real research means you spend an equal amount of hours looking at conflicting sides of an argument and then an amount of time with yourself to weigh out those pros and cons and go through real critical thinking, formulating stances on really important complex issues. And I just don't think we do that in this day and age. And that's why you have people calling Joe Rogan like an alt-right <laughs> or like, I don't know if you've heard some of that stuff, but it's- Or co-op. Just because, yeah, it's all side. It doesn't matter, yeah. right? And that's One extreme gonna, or the other. It's probably gonna start happening to us after enough. <laughs> after this conversation <laughs> enough of these videos yeah yeah it's just like this is just this is the problem you have to be able to have nuanced conversation and critical thinking if you really want to know what's true you have to go into everything without a bias bottom line yeah which is next to impossible so the next best thing i would say is accept that you're going into it with a bias but be willing to admit you're wrong that's happened to me more times than i can count like i said i went into this like I was, you know, 17 and just like a rebellious teen and was like, fuck the government. And I went into it trying to prove that. And what I found was like, it's not the government. It's not the government at all. Like, I don't have any problems with the government anymore other than one simple fact. And it's not a problem. It's just a fact. The public sphere will never allocate capital remotely close to as effectively as the private sphere. Privately owned companies like any entrepreneurial created company and organization is 10 times more effective than the government trying to solve that problem. I don't care if you're talking about social security, Medicare, insurance, fixing our roads, uh, taking us to the moon, climate change, like whatever problem you think the government needs to do, realize that they suck at that. <laughs> and it's baked into the system. And that's only true a hundred percent of the time though, Jeremy. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got to keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I should have disclaimer. It's only <laughs> true 10 out of 10 times. But for um, real, this is, this is a fact. The government isn't interested in doing the best job. They're interested in centralizing power. Yeah. And keeping their own jobs. And it, it, it's, there's so much to it, right? 
But uh, so to wrap up media, movies, culture, Hollywood, we touched on media and hopefully you can understand the issue when uh, you think you're a Republican. So you're turning into Fox News or you think you're a Democrat. So you're turning into, I don't even know, CN, CNBC. Um, I, I don't know how those work because they're all not real to me, but you think you're getting different opinions. But if you really did the research, <laughs> a lot of times they're owned by the same exact company who's just pressing a button doing this little psychological experiment experiment similar to like uh watching rats in cages and trying to see what they need to do to get the rats to fight and that's basically like what the media companies do with advertising dollars <laughs> yeah. and if you can't see that once again what level of consciousness are you in and then the next question let's say you're like i'm in a great level of consciousness jeremy all right. Well, if you're still partaking in those things, consuming that, what level of consciousness are you in during and after you consume that? And I'll just leave that at that. I want to segue a little bit and go into Hollywood. This is particularly fascinating to me. And I don't know if you, you knew this, Aaron, but I came across it in my research. Do you know when Hollywood was created? Mm -hmm. No. Guess. Um, just think about like some historical dates in regards to like these systems, right? I want to say twenties or thirties, maybe 1908. Okay. And we have the United States going bankrupt for its final time in 1912. And we have the creation of the fed in 1913. Yep. And we have the creation of birth certificates right around that time. <laughs> so it's like. Well, as I was doing some uh, some further research for this for this episode, oh my god, so much happened between 1905 and 1915. Like if that decade, like if if this was a time travel movie, and me and Aaron are like, we have to go back and save the <laughs> save the planet, and it takes us back to 1905, and we have to like change some shit so that cert a few different tycoons don't make the selfish decisions that they do. Literally, there were like five decisions that have created what we now know to be why everyone's pissed in 2023. So Marty McFly didn't like, go back far. <laughs> baby, it's it's crazy, far. man. So just to let you all know, like Hollywood, the place already existed, but Hollywood, the um, industry, the entertainment industry was created in 1908. And we can think of this, by the way, which you guys can do your own research on this, but Hollywood is basically, at least it was initially created, you can argue if it still is used, I think it's probably obvious, but it was created by a three-letter acronym um, to serve as the vehicle through which much of their agendas um, were going to be delivered. And an easy way to think of this is when you're entertained, you're put into an alpha wave brain state. And for anyone who's unfamiliar with um, neuroscience and alpha waves, theta waves, etc., your brain states dictate what parts of your brain become open, receptive, and malleable. And if you're in like high beta, that's like a highly anxious everyday state, like most people are stuck in beta. It's not as easy to access your subconscious mind as it is if I start to get you very relaxed and focused on your breathing and now you're in alpha you feel very present time distorts there's a disconnection to 3d time that's alpha music and movies get us into alpha states sometimes theta states why do they do this well because subconscious messages can then be entrained into your psyche much easier much easier and you're far easier to influence. Um, if you guys want, though, to go deeper on this subject, there's a great documentary called Out of Shadows. I believe it's on YouTube. If not, it's probably on Rumble or something. And it goes deep into the history of Hollywood and how Hollywood is so weaponized. And uh, th there's one scene, Jeremy, from that documentary that, that stood out to me the most, which is this was from the 1970s after MK Ultra came out when we we found out through a FOIA request that yep the CIA has been psychologically experimenting on manipulating the American public and they had a CIA agent on some talk show in the, in the documentary they're showing it 
and the, the talk show agent or um, talk show host asks, asks the CIA agent, so like, what can you tell us about, you know, the extent of this mind control that the CIA has been doing on the public through our TV and whatnot? You know, how, just how far does it go? And he kind of reels back in his chair like this and then kind of glossy eyed looks up towards the ceiling and he goes, oh, it goes beyond your wildest comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, okay, question answered. That's hilarious. So yeah, it goes deep. <laughs> It's a perfect example. Like a lot of them don't understand the true nature of things. Yeah. She's like, I bet they're choosing what TV stations I get to watch. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah that, sweetheart. That, that naivete. So yeah, we're, we'll kind of wrap up this section, but just understanding that there is a news and entertainment system and whether you're one of those people who's like, well, good news. I don't even watch the news, Jeremy, because I already know this. Cool. But but also being aware of that on the entertainment side, right? Look, I watch uh, Netflix sometimes. We we like to usually watch like Gaia and stuff like that. But you know, I watch movies. I, I'm a big fan of movies. I um, same. I love studying film and and the deeper messages and paying attention to things deeper than the plot and understanding the lighting and understanding why they choose different angles. And I'm a nerd like that. I like that. Um, but at the same time, it's more of like I'm psychoanalyzing what are they trying to program me re with right now? And so it doesn't have the same effect. Uh, you know, you can see it easily when you're aware of it. Yeah, yeah. And so and it's then, not um, a little bit deeper than that is just like when you're watching something, just always be at least make it a, a simple habit that's um, honestly very beneficial to do is just asking yourself, what is the deeper message of this TV show? Or what is the deeper message of this movie? And if you can just ask yourself that, you'll get way more out of it than most people who are just like surface level. They're like, oh, this is a great plot. And they don't understand that they're actually being told, like, let's say, like in the story, in the example of like a kid's story, you think like, oh, this is about like uh, Peter Rabbit and he's just trying to win the race. And it's like, that's not what it's about. <laughs> they're teaching your kid a subconscious um, fable or parable or or story. And that we do that a lot of times through myth. So people will just be like, oh, it's sci-fi, it's fantasy, it doesn't matter. It's like, no, it does matter. It's reflecting back something true about reality and that gets directly imprinted into your subconscious. And so you always wanna just try to, you know, it's, it's just a good consciousness and awareness exercise. It's just asking myself like, what is the actual message here? And um, Yeah, and, and just to be in reality, right? Like this is the reality that you live in. It's just like a YouTube ad on YouTube, like, you just, you accept the fact that if you're going to watch free, great YouTube videos, you're going to have companies that are paying those creators to you put are their ads. The product. <laughs> you're the product, right? So like in the same way that uh, Netflix, you know, creates entertainment, Netflix is paid, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars by like nonprofit, far left democratic organizations to say, hey, we'll pay you um, 20 million bucks to make a show that is centralized around LGBTQ stuff or whatever. And Netflix is like, we're just a business here to make money. We don't care about morality or what's right or wrong. Like we're just gonna do whatever we're getting paid to do because we're for profit. So there's no great evil conspiracy there, right? It's just the way things are. And you have to be aware of that. Yep, very well said, simple as well. So now we're gonna get a little bit into like money supply, currency and banking, how this came about as well as, um, you know, kind of where we're at with things. So we used to have a more decentralized, very decentralized form of kind of like barter and trade. So I want you to like, just imagine you get transplanted back in time to like the 1500s, 1600s, right? You're mobbing around on horses and everyone has a gun because constantly have to worry about that. And you really can't have too much shit. You can, because you have to carry it and you constantly have the threat of being robbed. So everyone just has some stuff. And so like, but what you can do is you can have skills and you can trade those skills or whatever it may be, crops, skills, but remember crops can get stolen, skills can't. So uh, it's probably more practical. So let's say you, you can be a handyman or something or whatever, and then there's a woman and she's not very good with like physical labor, but she can provide more uh, nurturing services, whatever that may be. So w there would be a lot of that. It was peer to peer decentralized barter and trade but here's the thing while many of you listening well some of you listening to this are probably like 
let's go back to that. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like that, uh, the, the first, first world problems, right? Like when you're raised with such privilege and entitlement, you actually think like, let's go back to that. It's like, really? You sure you want to go back to the 1500s? No, we need to go beyond it, actually. Exactly. We would so have the same kind of... system in 10 years that we have today if we were snapped back to that kind of barter and trade system. In 10, 20 years, the same companies would own everything. We'd be back to where we are. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And we'll get to probably, we should get into that. But so what I want to kind of demonstrate here is just being realistic. Once again, we need to understand history before we start acting like we know everything about every conspiracy and we just want to focus on regurgitating YouTube videos. But it's like, can you even tell me a realistic background of like where we came from? So, you know, that's kind of how things were. And uh, while some of you may think like, that's great, let's go back to that, growing our own food, blah, 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 it does have serious limitations. So let me kind of break it down like this. When a group of people lack a centralized or agreed upon form of currency. So I want you to think about it like it's 1500 and um, I'm trying to get Aaron to like repair my door. Cause you know, some wild West dude drop kicked it and I'm not very good with my hands and he, and I'm trying to pay him with like my fresh cow's milk. <laughs> and he's like, I'm lactose intolerance, bro. I don't want your cow's milk. I'll and I'm take like, cow's well, milk all day, bro. Well, yeah, but let's just say so then, <laughs> so he doesn't want the currency that I'm trying to give him. And because we don't have an agreed upon centralized form of value that we refer to as currency, it poses a lot of issues at scale. A people, an economy cannot prosper without a centralized form of agreed upon currency. Hopefully we can understand that. It was a serious advancement for us to go from, hey, I have 10 radishes, can I trade you for a chicken? Like that was currency, but there was no agreed upon barter. So like it introduced unnecessary complexity and civilization as we know it couldn't innovate and scale to its highest potential because of that. So introducing, you know, an actual centralized form of communication or sorry, of a currency. So we start using gold and metals as a form of barter. And this is a huge advancement. Because at least we can all agree now that, you know, this gold has X amount of value and now we have some sort of calibrated system. But this is extremely limiting as well compared to what it could be because you can't haul much gold. Gold is very heavy. For anyone who stacks gold, you know, um, real gold is heavy. And so it's very limiting in terms of you can't haul it around and also its size. Um, if you have any meaningful worth in gold, it takes up some serious space and it's heavy. And so what came with this? Well, everyone had to carry guns. You constantly had to be ready to use them and defend yourself um, or you'll get robbed. And so, you know, that was the initial purpose of banks, which I've talked about, right? Um, Aaron, if you remember me showing you, I think it was uh, 12 USC 1431, uh, the, the thing about the powers and duties of banks. Do you remember me showing you that? And nowhere in there did it say lend. So right. initial, that's because banks weren't meant to lend. They were supposed to just be like holding houses, like because yeah. it's not practical to carry around a few, you know, dozen pounds of gold. You put it in the bank and you, you get the IOU that that was what it was supposed to be. So anyway, that was kind of like, um, the next iteration. And then that brings us up to Jekyll Island. So finally, dun, dun, we, dun. Yeah. <laughs> and I've angles. talked about that before, but, uh, amazing book on it. The creature from Jekyll Island. Um, I believe it's by Edward Griffin, I believe. Yeah. Um, so check that out. Uh, I would recommend the audio book. It's very dense. Um, so anyway, finally, we have a select few families. So I want you to take yourself back to a time when we're in that gold situation I'm talking about. It's heavy. It has serious limitations. There is, I'm an entrepreneur, right? So I'm always thinking in terms of disruption and innovation. How can I take and something being done and do it better? How can I improve society, right? So it needs to be cheaper, faster, more integrous, more efficient, whatever. So it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, we're, we finally have a currency that's agreed upon, 
but there are serious limitations with it. it it's not really good at scaling. It still has to be carried and transported. It's really fucking heavy. It has to be defended. So now you need like militia and uh, protection and ar armed vaults and all that, right? Um, bank robberies. And then for the citizens carrying it, that, that's a serious issue because now everyone needs a gun and you have to deal with that. And So there's, there's issues there. Well, just to give so, some reference to that, Jeremy, before we had this third bank, uh, United States Federal Bank set up that you're about to talk about in Jekyll Island, there was two other attempts before that. Uh, the first one failed after like 20 years because the American people realized what the banks were doing, which is, you know, all a, all a bank has to do is say, hey, I can just loan out more IOUs than I actually have gold. And nobody will know unless, of course, everyone demands their money back at once. That'd be the only way they could know. Run and on so, the bank. And so when that would happen, America did find out that they were doing that because that's what happened. Everybody panicked from the market crash, said, I want my money. The bank said, oh, we don't have your money. And then they th overthrew the bank. And then six or seven decades later, the second attempt at a United States federal bank was set up. And then Andrew Jackson, the seventh president, he had a huge um, vendetta against the banks because he knew how corrupt they were. And he said, we cannot allow a central bank in this country. And he like single-handedly overthrew the second United States federal bank. I think he even executed some of the bankers for their, for their uh, crimes against humanity and whatnot. So Jekyll Island was now the third attempt from these central banking families to centralize all the monetary power in one spot. And they figured out how to do it the third time by basically tricking the public into thinking that it was their bank, right? It's the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. It's, it's our bank. And the third time is when it finally worked. Something about doing things in threes. Eh? <laughs> Magic number. It's interesting. There's some legal implications there. For sure. So uh appreciate that context. That's pretty that's pretty dope. I didn't have a full background on all that. So finally we have a select few families. <clears throat> I'm just gonna name a few Vanderbilts, we've got the Rockefellers, we've got the Rothschilds, probably familiar with some of these names. So let's um just quick overview. I've already talked about this on a number of podcasts, but um Jekyll Island. So we have a number of these families. They secretly come together. They have a secret meeting on Jekyll Island to come up with the formation of some form of centralized bank. As Aaron said, this had been tried. Um, they made sure to learn from the uh, mistakes that had already been made. They needed to um, be more clever in how it was presented, uh, use a bit more propaganda, a more sly approach. They wanted to create a central bank that would print and control all of the United States money supply, um, superseding the government itself. So I think this is a good opportunity to um, kind of demonstrate what, what I, we've been talking about, where it's like the government gets blamed for a lot of things that have nothing to do well, I'll say have little to do with the government. Like when the Fed, the Fed is basically select few banking cartels, uh, banking families really. And if they decide to do X, Y, and Z, the government gets blamed. But like the government is like their number one borrower. Like the government is in debt to the Fed. I just want you guys to understand that. <laughs> Uh, when you they, see when you see the government do anything from now on, you should see it as the central banks doing that thing through their much. puppet of the government, right? Yeah, the, the government is in debt to the Federal Reserve Bank, the central banks, and that means that uh, it's basically if, if you're in debt to someone, you are their asset until you pay off that debt. So yep. the government is like another asset in Leverage. the central bank's wallet, right? Mm -hmm. So they're they're the ones calling the shots and making all the decisions. Because why? Because the government's their debtor. So yeah. now they have to do whatever they say until they're not their debtor. And that's why they want this huge debt limit to just keep going up forever and forever. So this control can keep happening. When you see this debt, oh, $31 trillion in debt, like 90% of that is debt to our own bank. Yes, exactly. And that's yep. not our debt, right? Not, not your debt or my debt. No. Yeah, and that's where you want to look. Uh, you want to study 18 USC 8 until it really clicks. I'll just leave that for y'all. We'll put it up on the screen as well. 18 USC 8. So their plan, obviously, they're like, look, instead of trying to have to deal with the government, we're just going to supersede them. We'll create this relationship where, you know, they wanted to invent this um, fiat currency and kind of it would be presented. It, it's, it's just like what happened in 2020. 
there's this problem and then it's presented as this amazing solution. I'm not even going to use certain words because I don't feel like getting a potentially shadow ban, but um, you know, there's a problem. I believe it's called Hegelian, Hegelian. Di dialect or whatever. Hegelian. Mess up yeah. the first word. Hegelian dialect. Yes. So same concept, right? So there's, there's an issue promoted as the amazing solution and people don't see the backhanded intentions. So at first it seems great. Like at first I would have been like, hell yeah, this is going to be awesome. You know, it's a huge advancement innovation, but what are the intentions? Who's actually behind this? Where's the money? So, um, you know, that's kind of how that went down. This essentially trapped the government in a position where still to this day, so that's 1913 still to this day, our government doesn't get to do what it wants. For example, you can't, you can't just get, let's say for a lot of people, a Trump into the office and think he's going to drain the swamp. He's going to, he's our savior. And it's like, how'd that turn out? How'd that turn out? Why? Because they don't really have that much power. You don't understand how this stuff works. Yeah. It's like, like it's, it's not even that the government doesn't have enough power. The government is presidents. the banks. Yeah. Like they are the bank. They're just, it's just another front for the bank. When we yeah. talk about the Hegelian method, like there's problem, reaction, solution. Yeah. These are the systems that they work on, right? The problem is created by the institutions, whoever wants, who has a motive to make money and profit will create some kind of problem. And then the media controls the reaction. We need a blankety blank medication for this immediately because this is killing people. And they're trying to control the reaction. The public follows suit. And then the government plays the role of the solution. Oh, we are your saviors. Here's the solution. Right. It's just a ring of cooperation. Right. So the, that'll that sets them up for a situation where they're like, all right, we're going to do what's in the best interest of our people. We're, we got your back. We're going to pass so the a policy. Want. We're going to get it passed immediately in the House yeah. or in the Senate. Emergency Act. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of people are seeing through that. I, I just 2020 Big time. backfired. So, but anyway, yeah. So this kind of all took place in um, 1913. And, and since that time, fun fact, the dollar is worth exact, almost exactly 30 times less than it was before 1913. Wow. So in other words, $1 in 1913 is worth almost exactly $30 today. And none of this started happening until the creation of a federal reserve currency. So once again, if there's a, I mean, there's a lot of themes <laughs> today, but one major theme I want to express that's more um, tangible. It's not, it's nothing crazy is that if there's one thing humans do, it is innovate. It is in our DNA to grow, to evolve, to aspire for more, to build. We seem to not be able to help ourselves. For better or for worse, that's where we're going towards. If it means we cease to exist, then it means we cease to exist, but that's what humans seem to have to do, to push it. And as we push it, there are pros and cons to innovation and disruption. But one of the things that has to happen as we innovate is centralization naturally occurs. The aggregation, because it's way more efficient when you're dealing with large bodies of people to deal with centralized systems. It is efficient. It is convenient. It reduces complexity, which makes it possible and scalable. That's all great. The Fed was, from a certain angle, justified and rationalized as well-intentioned because it did do that. It made it a lot more simple. It's way easier to track numbers that each have their own barcode and they're super fucking light and flimsy and most money is digital now. It's easier, it's way easier. So it, it can be a more efficient system for more people, but at what cost? So the recurring theme here that's worth noting is that every time we have a new proposal, a new innovation, a new technology, a new system, whatever it may be, you want to kind of ask yourself, basically you want to do a pros cons analysis because usually centralization, it gains us convenience and a lot of times makes things cheaper, which everyone immediately buys into like cough, cough, stimulus. People love free money, cheaper shit. Mm -hmm. but they don't look over here. Why is it cheaper? At what cost? At the cost of your privacy, at the cost of decentralization, 
at the cost of now it's like 10 times more likely that this institution over the next few decades becomes corrupt and hijacked like that. Those are the risks, counterparty risks we run when we centralize power because now it's impossible to hijack a decentralized system. I don't want to say impossible because actually nothing's impossible statistically. Uh, it's just highly improbable to hijack a decentralized system, whatever it is, because there are so many things you would need to control and hijack and manipulate and suppress that it just wouldn't work. It would be too complex of a job to do that. But when power gets centralized, now that becomes pretty appealing to bad actors, if you will, because once, once power is centralized, now you just have one target to go after. And if you got enough money or you got the right strategy or the right art of war, power dynamic tactics, you can probably pull that off. And then people refer to that as Illuminati. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's it's easier at that. Yeah, it's just easier. But I've heard you make this point as well that you know, banks, for example, used to have real gold. That was the idea. Get, bring your bars of gold in. We'll keep them in a safe and we'll give you an IOU. You can exchange it anytime. And then over time, they just had the paper IOUs and no actual gold. And then now we're just all exchanging debt notes. And then after a while now, it's just like a ledger on a computer. You take out a loan from the bank and someone on a ledger just writes, you know, 150K. And then now we're trying to move to a digital currency system where they, there's literally no money at all. And it's like, can you see why there's this movement from reality to illusion? It's because if one person or, or system controls this one thing we all need to live and they can just print infinite amounts of it, it's like, not only is this not gold, it's not even paper, it's not even digital, money's whatever I say it is because I print it, I create it. That's what they're trying to do to create this form of enslavement, right? So cryptocurrency is one example of a response to that, which says, hey, Let's make a currency that is impossible to inflate by making a finite amount of it, and it's never allowed to be printed ever again. Now we have something decentralized, right, that can't be controlled in that same way. Yeah, yeah, those are great examples. And exactly, crypto is, at least a lot of crypto, is an antidote to that. So now we're in a position where uh, the Fed's been established. Um, we have a select few families, all of a sudden more powerful than any world government. And we're in this situation where we have a few families. Most of them are foreign, not even, you know, United States. And they're controlling the entire money supply of the world's superpower. So um, the world reserve currency is the United States dollar. We know that. Um, and you have the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank, pretending to be a federal entity, which obviously is not, but it is the it is the bank for the world's reserve superpower. So it's not just like it's any central bank. It is the central bank. And they put themselves in a position to where they're able to profit off of war, regardless of what side it is. Either side, both sides any sides they profit off of it they're able to profit off of inflation they're able to profit off of deflation they're able to profit off of government spending because who loans it to them <laughs> they're able to profit off of government borrowing obviously because who loans it to them and on and on and on so that was really an insanely high level chess move um, for them to just supersede um, the government and just be like yo look we'll be your money printer it's going to be really convenient for your citizens. Like most of them are going to have no fucking clue what's going on. They're not, they're not going to understand how inflation works and that we're slowly siphoning their money from them over time. Um, and then like you guys will be able to be in perma debt to us. We know you're already bankrupt, so <laughs> we're not going to, your secret's safe with us. We're not going to tell anyone we'll continue to loan a bankrupt company with nothing on its balance sheet. <laughs> we'll continue to loan it endless trillions of dollars and um as long as you know we can keep this relationship hush hush and it's yep. lasted over a hundred years eventually the u.s goes off of the gold standard and things really shift now the dollar has no peg it has no intrinsic value and if you aren't privy to how this game is really being played and how the fed has managed to get everyone in debt to them the citizens and the governments doesn't matter and the banks because like so the the central bank trickles down to the banks then the banks 
divvy out to the citizens, but the central bank also divvies out to the government. So like literally everything commercially is below them. Um, we, we can only ever be in debt to them and they can never be in debt to us because they print our money, right? Pretty much. Yeah. That's a simple way of putting it. So, um, you know, if you're not privy to how the game is really being played once they took us off the gold standard and how the Fed managed to do this and how the wealthy work around this reality, you find yourself successfully in a situation in which by merely existing year after year, you have more and more and more of your wealth siphoned from you. And there's nothing that you can do about it just by existing. That's it. And for most people, they're existing on a salary or hourly based fixed ish income. So you're making 60 K 60 K 60 K 60 K 60 K over a five year period. Maybe there's small increases, but the dollar is worth 90 cents, 80 cents, 70 cents, 60 cents. <laughs> And rent costs a thousand, eleven hundred, twelve hundred, thirteen hundred. Things are just getting siphoned from you more and more and more. And the incentivization at a base system level, like the first principles of how the system works, it is incentivized to print more, mm -hmm. not less. That's why really the only solution would be to the Fed would have to cease to exist. We can't have a Fed. If and we the really want these issues. Yeah, exactly. So using the analogy, Jeremy, of the, the nickel being worth a gallon of gas in the 50s, you could like imagine if your grandpa was time traveled from when he was 18 or whatever in the 50s and he was time traveled to today and you're walking around showing him what 2023 is like, but his financial currency from his world goes with him to your time so that when when you go to purchase a hamburger, it costs you five bucks. And then your grandpa goes to purchase it for a nickel and gets the same hamburger. All of a sudden you're like, yo, grandpa's loaded. Like grandpa can buy us a, a house for $50,000. Like, let's just give grandpa the money. He'll go buy it for us. That's how much purchasing power the dollar had in his day. And so we're saying this is what the Fed has done to our dollar that we have to survive on is they've devalued it so much through all this corruption and stuff. And it's because this is literally a business model, right? Mm. Like Jeremy said, Federal Reserve is a private for-profit corporation that's regulated by Dun & Bradstreet like any other private for-profit company. So I have a screenshot here I'll put on the screen of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, for example. This is their Dun & Bradstreet profile you're looking at. Well, how could they have a Dun & Bradstreet profile if they're not a commercial business? It's because they are, right? So yep. if let's say this would never happen because nobody, the Federal Reserve would never sell their company to anyone. But hypothetically, let's say McDonald's buys the Federal Reserve Bank tomorrow. <laughs> and then McDonald's yeah. takes over the money printing. And now we all have McDonald's bucks. And yeah. they're printing them out. And we're like, I'm not paying for stuff with this piece of trash. And you're burning it and stuff. Like, I'm not paying with McDonald's bucks. That's not real money. That is exactly what the Fed has done, essentially, with the dollar bill that says debt note on the back. It's like some business that made a money printing company and tricked you into using their monopoly money. And we're all none the wiser, right? Literally. Yeah, it is. It is crazy to like really sit with that for an extended period of time. Like, <laughs> why, wait, what? <laughs> Reality is crazier than fiction, man. Yeah, like, like it could have just as well just been colored monopoly money 100 percent. just whatever they decided on and that that's why it's it's just so impressive and so much of this stuff comes down to narrative and propaganda and then lobbying efforts because right. it's not like a logical thing it's purely through hijacking our our emotions and it's such a gradual shift too. That's how they it also do gradual. this. They do yep. it so slowly over yes. decades that no one really notices, right? Yeah. Minus 2020, but <laughs> yeah, generally they go slow because we see when they go fast in 20, like they did in 2020, we notice. wake up, it's yep. too fast. They tone it back, right? Now we're seeing them walk back a lot of the statements, claims. We won't get into that, but all right, guys. So we're going to wrap up part one here. And then tune in next week and we're going to catch right up where we left off with part two. And so we'll, we'll be breaking these nine parts up into a three part series. 
Uh, we want to thank you guys for tuning in. We hope this has been valuable. And uh, we'll see you next week for uh, part two. Uh, anything you want to say, Aaron? Yeah, I just want to give you guys some time to digest everything we went over today. And so we'll see you next week and we'll go a little deeper down the rabbit hole. That's right. All right. Appreciate you guys. And we'll see you soon. Peace and love.